Good evening and welcome and great to see so many of you joining on tonight for tonight's 5 by 15 and I'm really excited about tonight's conversation between James Bridal and Brian Eno. Brian Eno has been with 5 by 15 many times, we've been lucky enough to collaborate with him. Brian, as you know, is a composer, a producer, the co-founder of The Long Now, a director of Earth Percent, as well as being a trustee of Client Earth. He does all things environmental and all things wonderful. And he's been joined tonight by James Bridal, who's joining us from Greece, from an island called Egana, which is not too far from Athens. And James has written this really extraordinary book, which you saw the cover of when the holding slide came up. It's called Ways of Being. James in this book challenges the notion that there is only one kind of intelligence, that basically that, that intelligence is our intelligence, i.e. Western, male on the whole intelligence and that everything must be measured by that yardstick. He upends this totally. You read this book a bit like a thriller. You read it a bit with your heart in your mouth, hoping that we're going to have time to appreciate and learn from all the extraordinary things that James has learned in the process of writing this book before it's too late. Well, that's sort of how I felt, but I'm now about to hand you over to Brian, who's going to explore it. now. Please uh, put your questions into the chat, into the, sorry, the Q&A box. We'll come to them in about 40 minutes. And if you want to ask specific questions of Brian, please let us know because they're both going to be here to be talking. And please buy the book. It's a fantastic read and it's a fantastic book that I know you're going to want to keep around. That's how I feel about it. Not one that you just read and then park in the bookshelf. It's available from our bookseller, Newham Books. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm going to hand the floor or the Zoom or whatever you call it over to my friend, Brian Eno. Brian, the floor's yours. Thanks, Rosie. Um, you're right, it's a fantastic book. And I kind of knew it was going to be a fantastic book when I just started to get a sense of what the um, what areas were covered in the book. I, I have a thing about when I go into a bookshop, I always pick the book up and look at the index first, because it gives me an idea of what the scope of things is. And the more confusing the index is, that's to say the more apparently unrelated topics there are in it, the more interest I am to read the book. Um, and this one is, <laughs> this, this has a great selection. Um, it's, it goes from sort of monkey spirituality to water-based computers to cybernetics to, um, I don't know, sortition, which is a very interesting subject, you know, randomness. Um, so it covers a lot of areas uh, that I've been interested in personally for quite a long time, but it draws them together. So it starts to knit a patchwork of ideas that becomes very strong as you read through the book. Um, of course, the, I think the central subject, as, as Rosie said, is um, the issue of intelligence and what do we mean by intelligence? And of course, historically, what we meant by intelligence, as, as Rosie said, was a sort of faculty of human brains. Um, and it was not until really the last hundred years or so that we started to realize that this thing called intelligence didn't only belong to us um, and that we started to notice it in animals. And of course, at first we were quite condescending about that kind of intelligence. But then we started to notice that there were different sorts of intelligence, um, collective intelligences, for example, the intelligence of a, a hive. Um, now, the question is, of course, always, do we call that intelligence as well? Do, do we include that in the category? Um, I think we should, and obviously James does. Now, perhaps I can uh, start by asking you um, if we if we start moving away from this concept of intelligence as a purely human thing, um, how far can we go in that direction? Um, you you go a long way in your book, and perhaps you could just trace that that story that you've um, drawn out for the benefit of the viewers. Hello, James. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you. And hello. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for doing this. And thanks to everyone who's here. And thanks to 515 for putting it on. Um, yeah, I, I, I started writing the book 
with my own very sort of narrow idea of what intelligence is or might be um and really very little preconceptions of what kind of definitions of it might be but with the very strong awareness that at some point in writing it i was going to have to define it because that's the kind of thing you have to do in a book with the word intelligence on the cover um and so I, I was sort of I was hunting around and I was I was reading these various things. Um, and, and every every definition that I that I came across felt um either sort of deeply conditional uh, or deeply limited uh, and deeply restricted uh to um to kind of one particular instance of intelligence. Our intelligence is this because this, this, and this make it up. And you're like, okay, well that, that works for this example, but I'm interested in this other thing over here, and it doesn't quite seem to fit. Um, and and the, the, the thing that I'd started to struggle with, that actually one of the roots into this and why I wanted to find some kind of useful definition is because for many years, I've been interested in working with artificial intelligence, um, which um, is a strange thing that we're also still struggling to define, um, but is very obviously not fitting uh, into the kind of categories of intelligence that we've, we've always used before. Um, and my first kind of realization was that, oh, well, this, this thing that we call intelligence and that we seem so happy to call intelligence and, and culturally we kind of put under the banner of intelligence for so long, um, isn't doing the sort of things that we expect human intelligence to do. And so immediately you get this kind of slight break in our conception. Oh, there's, there's something happening here, which seems to be intelligent. It's doing things that we consider to be intelligent, but the results are radically different to, to the human. And when you look at all the definitions of intelligence from that realization, you realize how narrow our idea of intelligence is when it's been entirely formed around the human. And so the working definition that I use at the outset of the book, at my kind of departure point, is to say, well, okay, actually, when we talk about intelligence, what we've always meant historically is human intelligence. And then when you start to use that word to talk about other forms of intelligence, the, 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 the definition of it kind of broadens and shakes into all of these other kind of strange, strange um, possibilities for what intelligence might be, whether it's um, problem solving, whether it's kind of abstract thinking, um, wh whether it's uh, any kind of kind of action in the world. It's suddenly what, what it crucially did for me is when it kind of came out of the head, it stopped being something that resided only within the skull, only within the individual and became something that that mattered, um, that became real when it emerged between bodies, between creatures, between species, between beings, and became something that was actually active in the world. Uh, and that for me was the real kind of moment of, of, of realizing that this idea of intelligence could be something much, much broader than, than just human intelligence or just a kind of codified set of rules that we're trying to put into an AI, and could be something that was a bit more like uh, uh, like being in the world, essentially, that was a, a, a relational quality that exists between things. There's, there's a word you use quite a lot, which I hadn't heard before I read this book. Um, and it's the word intra-action. Um, I think that's a very useful concept, and perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so the, 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 this term interaction that I use quite a lot comes from the philosopher and feminist theorist and quantum physicist, crucially, uh, Karen Barad, who's a really extraordinary thinker. Uh, and I first met Karen a few years ago when she spoke um, at an event I was at, and I, I wasn't familiar with her work at that time, though I realized that everyone else in the room was completely in awe of her. Um, and she gave, a, she gave an amazing talk in which she, um, in which she explained quantum physics, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. And I think there's probably only a few hundred people on the planet uh, who have a really deep understanding of what it is, and probably an even fewer, a uh, smaller number, who are actually capable of explaining it in such a way. And what was truly extraordinary about the talk that she gave was that while she was speaking, just in, in the, in, in the, while we sat in the darkness listening to the sound of her voice, the concepts that she was naming kind of hung there above our heads and we could see them and we could understand them. And in that period of time, while she was speaking, I understood quantum physics. And the moment she stopped talking, it sort of all fell apart. Um, I was left with the feeling that I had understood something very clearly and a kind of doorway had been opened 
but it was not one that I could necessarily relate to other people. But, uh, you know, I, I was left with a um, very much a partial understanding, a deep and kind of meaningful one, but not a, not the, the kind of clarity that a, a real quantum physicist had. And what was happening in that moment is what Barad calls intraaction, something that emerges in the moment between bodies. Um, yeah, as, as, as Brian is holding up the sign, saying that these are kind of two words. She, she usually does it with a kind of slash. If you read Barad's texts, um, they're full of these words separated by slashes that kind of serve to emphasize the kind of dual meaning of various words. Because mm -hmm. for Barad, everything is, everything is relational. Everything is about these moments when things touch each other. And that is the moment when the world comes into being. Uh, the world is not composed of kind of static fixed objects, but rather of relationships that emerge from the coming in, coming together of these various things. Yes. Um, so yeah, that, that was a huge influence on my ability to even like think about the kind of interactions, the kind of relationships that I was talking about when I was kind of groping towards this idea of a relational intelligence, an intelligence that emerges out of interaction. Yes. Yes, it's, it's an idea that I've been thinking about for quite a long time. I came up about 25 years ago with a word which was intended to replace the word genius. And the word is senius, S-C-E-N-I-U-S. And the, the notion of that idea was that, in fact, nearly all acts of what apparently are individual intelligence are actually acts of collective intelligence. Because what we're usually doing is we're drawing on a lot of other pieces of intelligence that came from other places and combining them somehow and repackaging them as, as our own ideas. Perfectly good, uh, good thing to do, but we tend to call people who do that very well geniuses. And I think what we should all, always be looking at is the sort of intellectual ecology of the, of the situation that they're in and realizing that very often there are people who make those systems work, those situations work, and they don't look to be very central to them, but like ecologies, they're very important. You know, it's a, it's a whole network of thought. And so I was interested in your book to see quite a lot of discussion of what I would call collective intelligence, um, where the creativity of something can't be located in any single mind within that system. Um, it's, it's, a comp it's the um, synergy of all of those minds together. Um, and I think sometimes that collective intelligence is distributed in space, sometimes in time, sometimes in both of those dimensions together. But it's, it's the, it brings you to another very interesting question, which I think you deal with very well in your section about AI. That's quite a lot of the book is about AI. Um, and this is asking the question of whether, if, if intelligence isn't necessarily located in single minds, if we accept that it's a collective phenomenon, it can be a collective phenomenon, is it, does it even have to be located in organic systems at all? Or can it be located, located in non-organic systems or quasi-organic systems, combinations of humans and, and their tools. And to me, it obviously is. And um, yeah, I mean, I think there's an, there's an example that I think is also maybe relates to the idea of seniors in some way. So I'd love to, to get your thought on it. And I think it's a nice way of, for, for everyone, for us to like imagine this idea of a kind of embodied intelligence, but also an inte intelligence that is not embodied in a single body that is like um, yeah. spread out into the world, which is that there's been some really interesting research in recent years around the cognition systems of spiders, um, which basically seems to suggest that spiders offload a certain amount of their cognition, of their awareness of the world into their webs, that their webs are essentially structures that hold some of their understanding of the world and that they can access that understanding and memory and certain ways of doing things in the world uh, through the web. And that by changing the shape of the web, if one is to interfere in the web, one then changes uh, the structure of the spider's awareness and, and its you know, understanding of the world. And for me, that directly relates to, I think what I think is a very human 
uh, understanding. Because actually, of course, we perform our cognition out in the world as well. Um, anyone who's ever been to, um, to, to a place maybe that they'd forgotten they'd been to before, and by being in that place, they kind of reactivate a memory or an understanding of something that had been lost to them before, has experienced this kind of extended cognition, this idea of kind of placing certain, not, not only memory, but even like ways of understanding and ways of thinking are actually outplaced into the world. And I think seniors is, is something that kind of perhaps kind of activates that in a certain way. Um, yeah. That the really like, not only just through place or as you say, inorganic matter, but into, um, into networks of other people. But of course it doesn't have to be people. Uh, it can be other, other beings, other species. It can be things um, mm -hmm. that uh, also kind of play a part in this, this extended cognition that is a huge part of, of intelligence, of thinking. Do you know how it works with the spiders? Do they, what do they read off? Are they reading the structure of the web or what qualities of the web are? Um, mostly they're, they're uh, building on, um, uh, I'm not a spider cognitive, cognitive scientist, um, but one of the things they're doing is that they're building certain memory of certain places in which uh, certain ways of building that are more efficient for catching certain things, perhaps at different times of the year or involving different other kinds of plants, um, so that the, the structure of the web uh, changes uh, throughout the year according to um, what particular prey might be available or something like this. Uh, and when those, if that part of the web is removed, that, it, that ability to do that is lost. Uh, it can also be regained by then like creating a kind of fake web or the spider uh, relearns it in a certain way. Um, but it seems that if, if portions of the web are removed, um, like a, a, a certain abilities are essentially lost. Um, yeah. uh, that there's a there's a there's a a, represent, a representative kind of corollary between uh, certain ways of thinking and be behaving and this physical structure that the spider exists within. So, it's sort of interesting. It sounds a little bit like um, song lines, you know, this Aboriginal thing of song lines of having of sort of representing the world somehow in a in an abstract diagram outside of you and a diagram which you read by kind of living it you you work your way through it sort of thing um, yeah the song lines are a really good example because they're both a um a physical map like they're a, they're a, a mapping of stories onto the world mm -hmm. that allow one to uh, kind of recall stories and make sense of uh, one's place in the world through mythology to reference to physical objects around oneself, but they're also a way of being and moving through that territory. Um, they, uh, they, uh, um, um, they, they become a guide to the territory as well. If you know the story, you can then navigate the territory in certain ways. It will tell you, the stories will tell you how to get to certain things that you need, water or other people, or whatever it is. And also they're distributed. Uh, different people may hold different parts of the story depending on which part of the territory they're in. And the song lines connect up through different tellers of the story based on which location they are. So it's, yeah, it's, it's an example of that kind of extended cognition across multiple directions. Do you think religion does that now? I mean, this is not something you talk about in your book really, but um, I'm just wondering, it suddenly gave me a different view of religion. And I'm just wondering whether that's, that's a way of doing some kind of mapping of the world. I think there's a way of kind of uh, encoding uh, lessons history into narrative i mean i think it's quite a reductive view of religion perhaps but there's a, a kind of deep encoding of knowledge about the world into a format that can continue to be passed on in various ways even if we're not aware of it um uh that's definitely one of the roles that, that religious stories have in various ways i'm actually reminded of something that i learned about very recently which completely blew my mind um which is that um, this island that I live on that's in the picture behind me is actually one of a chain of islands uh, across the Saronic Gulf, uh, just south of Athens. Uh, and if you go back uh, kind of 140,000 years or so, um, the sea level was much lower. And so these islands were actually part of a land bridge. Um, uh, and there was basically the, the, the sea, the Mediterranean was to the south and there was a, a, a lake to the north. Uh, and over the 70,000 years kind of following that, the sea level slowly rose and the water breached at various points and these, these high points in the land bridge became an island. 
uh, became a number of islands. And I read this extraordinary paper in which uh, someone who calls themselves a, a, a geomythologist, which is already just a brilliant term, um, they, they looked back at uh, Hesiod's Theogony, which is kind of the, one of the major documents of Greek mythology, which kind of documents the basically the family trees of all the gods and heroes and so on and so forth. And they saw that in, 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 in the Theogony, uh, Hesiod wrote that um, there were this series of nymphs who were the daughters of Asopos. And Asopos was both a river and a king in kind of pre-Hellenic ancient, ancient Greece. Um, and these, these daughters were named, because it's a very strict family tree, they were named in the order of their birth. And those names of those nymphs correspond to the names of the islands in this chain. Mm -hmm. But the order in which they're named in Theogony correspond to the order in which they would have emerged as islands as the sea levels rose. Yeah. And so Hesiod was writing tens of thousands of years after this geological event occurred. Mm -hmm. But the, the writer of the paper makes the case that the, this mythology was was a, a, a recording, even if un, un, kind of unknowingly, of this geological event that had happened tens of thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. and that deeply buried inside most of our mythologies. You already mentioned the song lines in which this is this is undoubtedly true. Um, are these kind of deep recordings of of things that happened in the very very distant past, but have kind of remained with us in myths and various other forms. And it's really about how you choose to read and understand these things to what extent you choose to treat them as as fairy tales yes. or whether you understand them as kind of huge compacted bits of human history and yeah. perhaps more than human history yes um that's that's a really good story um i want to ask you now i'm sort of branching off to another area one of the sections of your book that i think is very very interesting is the discussion about randomness now as as a young disciple of John Cage, of course, I was very <laughs> familiar with randomness as a, as a compositional tool. Um, one of the things you talk about, though, is the use of randomness in science as, as a way of generating um, some, some kind of feeling for the real world. So, and also you talk about how difficult it is to generate randomness from a computer, which everybody who plays with randomness knows about that a computer just cannot do random. It, this is very interesting to me because you'd think it would be very good at that. But in fact, it's not very good at that at all. But I, I would like you to talk a little bit about the idea of randomness as an exploratory tool, as a way of finding things out. It's not an obvious yeah. thing to most people. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of those weird things you kind of find out in maths and computer science uh, that, um, that often you have to appeal to this apparently deeply unscientific process, essentially, which is which is randomness. Uh, we like to think that our sciences and our mathematics kind of honed us, hone us down to a set of kind of fixed rules that we can follow. Yes. Um, but it turns out really that any mathematical process of that kind is, you know, turns out to be when you get into larger and large enough fields, um, uh, the, the opposite of helpful. It kind of narrows us down into kind of fixed paths. And when we're dealing with large enough fields of interest, and when we're talking of a field of interest as large as the whole Earth, um, then anything that has been generated through a kind of fixed mathematical structure is going to be incredibly restricted. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the one of the kind of famous uses of this uh, in mathematics is a process called Monte Carlo, um, which is a mathematical process of kind of simulating a very huge number of possibilities through using a small number of random uh, tactics. This was discovered by, um, or at least proposed by, a, a, a mathematician physicist working on the Manhattan Project, Stanislav Ulam, um, who's kind of one of the pro progenitors of the atomic bomb. Uh, but what I love about this story is he actually came up with this idea while recovering a hospital from trepanation. Uh, he'd actually literally just had a hole drilled in his head because he'd had a I think water on the brain or some kind of you know, neurological condition. And he was in hospital playing solitaire. Um, and, uh, you know, because he was a mathematician in the kind of mind he had, he decided, he wondered if it was possible to figure out the probability of always completing a kind of full deck of solitaire from, from whatever his layout was. Um, and also because he's a mathematician, he realized that the, calculating the exact possibility of that incredibly huge number of possibilities were taking forever. 
So instead what he did was he just did a few ones at random and, and used that as a kind of subset to estimate the full number that was possible. Mm -hmm. And he realized that this would also be applicable to a problem they had with the atomic bomb, which was uh, to simulate the behavior of free electrons within a, a fissionable mass, i.e. the sorry, neutrons. Uh, what was happening at just at the moment of um, uh, the, the atomic explosion, when it was critical that they understood how all these billions of, of neutrons were behaving, uh, and they needed to mathematically model it in some way. And they realized, oh, well, we don't need to mathematically model every billion one of these neurons, uh, neutrons. Um, I keep saying neurons, which is possibly telling. Um, neutrons. Uh, rather, that they could simulate a, a random small number of these uh, and get a bigger picture. And he was like, great, this is good. So he went and spoke to John von Neumann, uh, another scientist worker, another kind of amazing mathematic, mathematic, mathematician physicist. And Neumann was like, this is brilliant, um, but where are we going to get random numbers from? Um, because he was more than aware that the problem with randomness that you described is that um, if you try and generate it with mathematics, then it's not random. Yeah. Uh, if you have any kind of fixed processes, for generating it, then there's always going to be some underlying pattern. And what they ended up doing for the Manhattan Project, working with the Rand Corporation, was they actually used um, uh, small um, nuclear sources. They used another radiation source that randomly would emit particles and measured these and used them much like a roulette wheel to generate random numbers. And this is what's really extraordinary about randomness and that I, I write about quite a lot in the book is that Computers need randomness for all kinds of things, for big science experiments like the, 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 the Manhattan Project, all the way through to kind of generating uh, cryptography for protecting your credit cards online, or all this kind of stuff. Uh, but in order to do so, they have to do something that computers very rarely do, which is to kind of reach outside themselves to the world. Mm -hmm. um, they have to engage with the world in some way. And some of the weird ways this is done are things like uh, putting up huge radio masts and measuring particles from space that interfere with the radio waves. Uh, those, are, those are random enough, more than any computer that can come up with. Or pointing a camera at a lava lamp and watching the weird wax kind of wiggle around in its own way. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, this is really critical to understanding something that I talk about quite a lot in the book, which is what I call a kind of technological ecology. A realization um, that um, for, um, computers for technology itself to um, kind of achieve its its kind of full potential, perhaps, it has to reach outside itself in this certain way, just as we do, just as we learn to become kind of more ecological. So the tools that we use all the time also have to be more connected to the world in this way. And randomness is such a good example of this, because it's so clear that this is like a necessary process to do this kind of crucial mathematical operation. Um, but also because of the extraordinary results that it produces. As, you know, as, as a fan of Cage, you'll, you'll know this, that some of his most extraordinary works were produced by kind of interacting with uh, these kind of chance uh, behaviors. So it has this incredible out, uh, role in kind of artistic practice. Mm -hmm. But it also, as I do in the book, has a, a role in, in political practice and in social practices as well. This, this is a very interesting part of the book. Um, sortition is something that I only became aware of. Sortition, by the way, is um, random, random, elect random representation, I would say. So instead of electing a government, as we have been doing, <laughs> um, you say to, we, we need 100 people, and you choose 100 people randomly, and they become your government, or 1,000 people, or 10 people, or whatever it is. And this, um, to great surprise, was the dominant system of um, government in the height of the, the great classical Greek era. Um, and they really only elected people for very particular jobs. For instance, they, I believe they elected the head of the army, didn't they? Um, I, th I think that was an election. But, but most of the government was made by, was, were decisions made by a random group of people who um, I think were not paid actually as well in many cases. Sortition was an unpaid job. It was, it was a little bit like jury duty where you were expected to do it. And the point of you being a randomly chosen citizen is that you might actually be more genuinely representative and less self-interested than somebody who, who was making a career out of it. You know, 
I, what I find interesting about the whole issue with randomness is that to, to understand it and to use it properly requires that you seed some control, S-E-D-E, no, C-E-D-E, not seed, seed. Um, so you, you say, I'm going to create a situation where I don't really control what happens any longer. And this, to me, is a very interesting moment in, the, in our technological history when we realize that we have to do this because we tend to think of technology as a system of control, as a way of controlling nature, keeping it in a box in some way. Um, and we tend to think of ourselves as the controllers. What we don't think about is that there are many, many situations where either we can't control because we don't have enough data or enough power or whatever we need, or we don't want to control because it doesn't produce kinds of results that we need. It doesn't produce results outside of the envelope that we can already define. If we want to get outside of that envelope, we have to use randomness of some kind. And I think what Cage was talking about was the idea of saying, I'm going to stop trying to be in control of this situation. I'm going to create a situation to which I will surrender. I use this word surrender a lot because I think I think on, on this spectrum of from control to surrender, we tend to always dignify things at the control end and say, that's important, that's serious. And at the surrender end, we say, oh, the, those are hippies. <laughs> they, you know, they don't really know what they're doing. Um, so I've, I've been thinking for a long time that we, what we really have to do when we're living our lives is to be able to navigate that spectrum properly there are occasions when we can fully control, and why shouldn't we um, in those particular cases? Uh, like building airliners, it's quite a good idea to be quite well in control of what you're doing. Um, on the other hand, um, having relationships, we want to be able to surrender. We want to not control, but to be in a kind of mutually surrendering relationship. So, so this... Um, the fact that this has now started to become um, a technological idea is very interesting to me because, you know, traditionally we think of technology as, um, as something that is built to control. And now we're finding we have to make technology that can surrender as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it, it was something that I, I struggled to articulate, I think, quite a lot. And particularly in my last book, I wrote a book called New Dark Age, where I wrote about a lot of the problems with technology. And one of the things that I really identified in that, in that book was, it seemed to me that one of the things that we as a society are struggling with in the present is um, the vast amount of knowledge and information available to us. And I don't just mean that in terms of too much information or the idea of information overload, which I, I don't entirely trust. I think we're always faced with huge amounts of information, always have been but particularly with very radically differing information, information that's trying to tell us very different things, that's presenting to us very different viewpoints on the world that are very hard for us to integrate. Because as you say, our natural desire is to kind of control, uh, at least inside our own heads, the kind of narrative that we tell ourselves about the world. And when that narrative is um, shaken up by the presentation of multiple different perspectives, of multiple different viewpoints, it becomes very hard for us to um, keep a kind of firm grip on our understanding of the world. And for me, that underlies a huge amount of kind of contemporary um, illness, malaise, yeah. uh, the fact that the dominant kind of mood of the world at present is kind of anger, shading into fear or, or the other way around. Um, that's a kind of disruption caused by this, this struggle to, to control, to reconcile these different viewpoints. And in that book, I talked quite a lot about the idea of unknowing, yeah. uh, this, this idea that perhaps one needs to be more comfortable with not being in control, as you say, with not having that kind of domineering kind of knowledge. Um, but I, as I said, I was, I'm not sure I terribly well articulated that. Uh, I don't know if I articulated any better in the new book, but it did come up a lot. And one of the ways in which it came up was, um, or the ways that I felt I was coming to understand what I meant a little bit better, was in our relationships with non-humans, with, yes. with um, the other beings that we share the planet with. Because if we are to have meaningful relationships with beings who are very different to ourselves, then we have to acknowledge that we cannot know them fully. Mm -hmm. um, that whatever 
their experiences of the world are, their ways of being in the world are. They differ radically from our own in ways that we will never completely understand. And one of the problems we've had throughout history, the reason we're so resistant to, to even acknowledging their intelligence or to, um, and certainly to living kind of peacefully and, and, and um, uh, kindly with them, is this urge to control and to dominate and to make knowledge out of them, to, to understand them in a way that kind of actually erases them, essentially because it just continually makes them either like us or kind of into machines or, you know, reduces their being in such a way that they, they, there's, no, there's no understanding of them as being beings in themselves. Yeah. Whereas with a kind of a sense of unknowing, um, or as you say, a certain kind of surrender, um, an acknowledgement that actually we cannot know everything and yet we can exist. We can exist without these forms of control, without these forms of kind of domineering knowledge. Uh, if we're prepared to to trust and to surrender to some extent uh, to the to the beingness of of others. Um, in fact, there was I marked one bit of your book that I want to read because it absolutely relates to this. Um, the third condition, unknowing, means acknowledging the limitations of what we can know at all and treating with respect those aspects of the world which are beyond our ken, rather than seeking to ignore or erase them. To exist in a state of unknowing is not to give in to helplessness. Rather, it demands a kind of trust in ourselves and in the world to be able to function in a complex, ever-shifting landscape over which we don't and cannot have control. So this, this to me is so, so interesting in talking about artists. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always asking myself, since I've been an artist for my whole adult life, um, and it's the only job I've had, really. I'm always asking myself, what's the point of being an artist? What do artists actually do? And I have several answers to that question, but one of them is that they help us to endure uncertainty. They help us to take pleasure in unknowing, to be willing to put ourselves into situations where we know we are not in control, where something is going to happen to us that that could be overwhelming in a certain way. And the reason they offer us that, the arts in general, is because we know we can switch them off. So I, I have this feeling that the great strength of art is that it's safe. It isn't the real world. So you can engage with it and you can have the feelings associated with engagement with that, but you don't necessarily have the consequences of it. So it's a little bit like flight simulation, you know, you go into a flight simulator. I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's it's a very exciting thing if you you're suddenly in command of a seven four seven with four hundred passengers behind you, and I crashed when I did it, and, and it was the most terrifying experience. So I had I had at least a good percentage of the feelings associated with a dramatic moment like that. But of course, then I got out of the flight simulation, feeling a little bit shaken, went back to my normal life. But, but I think, in a sense, a lot of what we do with art is to try to create other worlds like that, that we can enter into, see how they feel. And feeling is the important thing. We feel them and we think, oh, I have, a, I have an opinion now about that world. I have a feeling about that kind of world. You know, if I read, um, 1984, for instance, um, I'm left with a metaphor in my mind for what a kind of high surveillance controlling society would be like. And I take that around with me. And furthermore, when we have a conversation and I say 1984, I don't have to say, yes, I, I'm talking about a controlling society where there's this thing called Big Brother and blah, blah, blah. We share that knowledge. So I think, I think what artists are doing are exchanging feeling structures if you like saying how about this feeling can you remember that do you, do you associate that with anything anyway I'm, do you think, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea as well because in the, the last couple of years I've been very much reframing my own artistic practice around uh, questions of the environment and ecology and the climate emergency uh, and this book is one outcome of that very much and very much more at the discursive end 
um, but I also make kind of visual artworks and kind of practical pieces as well. And one of the ideas that I've actually been struggling with I, is to what extent an artist's work can engage more directly, I think, than what I hear you describing. I'm, I'm not sure it's quite as pulled back as you might say. Um, so, for example, one of the things that I do is I make uh, some of the structures that I've been burning recently, I've been making kind of solar panels and windmills. Uh, and the thing about those is that they're, I use this phrase quite a lot now, it's, it goes around my head, it's works that do work, uh, right? The artworks that actually kind of participate in the world in some way. Because I, I, I feel quite strongly that um, the kind of time for making work about the environment is kind of over. Uh, there's no point making work about climate change in the present because the work, all, all of us are so entangled with it and participating in it that um, the, the, there's a responsibility for the work itself to be part of a movement um, or a, a process of kind of change. And I wonder if that makes sense with your concept of, of kind of artistic works as well, if there's a way in which these works are not just kind of representations or kind of you know, pictures of feelings, but are actually something a bit more kind of concrete and processual as well. Yes, it, it does make sense. So the, these, what I'm always nervous about is propaganda art. I, I don't really want to make didactic art that says, this is how you should think about something. Um, and what I am very convinced about is that change, ch personal change, actually starts with feelings. Um, I think feelings are the beginning of thinking. Now, this is an idea that I owe to, uh, I think he's called a neuropsychologist called Mark Solms. Have you um, seen a book by him called The Hidden Spring? It's, it's, I, a, it's a, I think you'd enjoy it. It's a very, quite a big book. <laughs> Books are so big. <laughs> um, and some of it is, is pretty technical, but the essential message of the book is that all thoughts start with feelings um, and that that's the beginning of the process called thinking. But because feelings are very hard to quantify, very hard to describe, very hard to compare one, you know, my, my version of anxiety is the same as yours and so on and so on. Um, they tend to get left out of the discussion because they're too, they're too, elusive they're too amorphous um, so he makes an argument for saying that feeling is the first way that we we understand the world and it's the beginning of our understanding of everything and I like this argument because I think this this allies us much more with the rest of the animal kingdom if you like um, we've tended to make this distinct, distinction that says oh we know how to use our brains you know this is the main part of us and the, the kind of message of what he's saying is, no, there's a continuum of, of this thing called mind. And one end of that continuum is, is the thing called feelings. And in fact, we navigate very well with feelings. It's, it's, our, it's our first sense of a situation or of a person or of whatever's happening to us. So, so I think working with feelings, which is perhaps what you were um, criticizing there is actually it's a very good area to work in it's, it's not a criticism I, I, I one of the things that i feel quite strongly is that one of the dominant feelings of the present is helplessness yes. um, uh, and so you know anything that can be done to reduce people's general feeling of helplessness is the point at which we might start to have other feelings yes. um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly convinced now, ha having gone through the process myself, uh, and again, that being quite a big part of the writing of this book, that most of us are suffering from a kind of trauma in the present, um, you know, what, we, what is increasingly called climate trauma. Uh, the realization uh, of what is occurring on the planet is affecting most of us as a kind of trauma. Yes. And anyone who's been through um, any kind of who's, who's gone into this subject who's paid much attention in the last decade that has a, a kind of psychological effect mm -hmm. um it's creating in people um uh, a trauma uh, 
um, it, it may manifest, certainly for me, it manifested as something akin to depression, a, 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 a deep kind of worry, uncertainty, unhappiness at the state of the planet. Um, and and that is, that's a form of trauma. And yeah. one of the things that trauma does is that it, um, it blocks you, it freezes you in place. It prevents you particularly from feeling new emotions, from sort of moving through that period of being kind of locked into uh, that fear and uncertainty and helplessness. And so one of the, you know, one of, one of my responses to that was to learn as much as I could. And this book is kind of, uh, on one level, a very personal um, move, process of moving through that trauma to try and understand something new and to think some new thoughts mm -hmm. that would yeah. allow a kind of new process to occur. But all of that is, as you say, it's entirely feeling space. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, a friend of mine edited a book a few years ago where he asked a lot of scientists and me, funnily enough, um, what, what they thought about um, an AI future. You know, can you imagine a future where blah, 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 AI? And I said, well, I started thinking about that. And I thought, well, we're already in a future where, we, in a present where most of the things that go on around us are completely incomprehensible to us. And I just listed the things I do during the day, you know, getting up, having breakfast, having, making tea from, I don't know how that tea got here. I don't know how you make tea. I don't know how you grow it. I don't know how you import it, package it. I, and I just went through the day, in fact, just the first two hours of the day. And I thought, just like everybody else, I have no idea about the world that I live in. So it's a noble effort to try to come to grips with it. But the other noble effort is actually not to worry about it too much. To say, actually, we've always been very uncertain about most of the things that are happening to us. It's now suddenly in capital letters in our consciousness because suddenly there are a lot of things that look new all happening together. You know, AI doesn't seem to me that different from the, this huge sort of corporate um, carapace that covers the world now where money flows around like blood to keep it alive. And there are all sorts of things we just don't understand at all, like collateral debt certificates and um, all these ways of moving wealth in the form of money around. And we've, we've just come to accept it. I mean, most of us are utterly baffled by most of the things that, that we're doing most of the time, if we actually face up to it. I, I'm, I can possibly explain to you how a rainbow is made, but I don't know how a bank works. I don't know what a bank does any longer. It doesn't just sit on your money. It does, it does mysterious things, including producing weird derivatives that only a few people really understand. And clearly they don't understand it very well because periodically the whole system crashes as it did in 2008, because nobody understood it. So, so I'm not frightened of AI because I think we've been there for a long time in this overcomplicated, overconnected world. And I wonder if, do you think it's very different from the world that, you know, people of 10,000 years ago were living in when everything must have been scientifically mysterious to them? What makes it rain? What is this heat coming from? What is that thing that we're looking at that has all this heat? Um, how do these things grow? You know, there's this stuff that grows and I, if I put more of it in the ground, it grows again. How does that work? How do children appear? You know, there, is, is it different? Are we in a different place? Or do we just worry about it more? Um, I, I, think, I think there's a couple of things there. I think the first is that um, we've always had narratives for explaining how all of these things around us happen. Mm -hmm. Even if that narrative is like, God said it. Uh, like the, there was a there's a, a meaningful narrative that we tend to place on these things. As I as I said earlier, one of the characteristics of the present is that we have these very intense competing narratives mm -hmm. um, uh, that are that challenge us all the time with very different ideas about what these stories around the things might be. Yeah. And trying to sort out between those narratives is is I think where the where the where the troublesome 
dangerous, difficult uncertainty arises, and also a huge possibility for um, the concentration of power um, and very unequal power relationships arising. Um, I do think, and, and that, that's something that we're, that we're struggling with and, and working through in various ways. Um, but I, I do think I do think something is different about the present, um, and the couple of things that that I, you know are are radically new are that we, in the one hand, we have um, we have a much clearer is a diff difficult word, but we consider ourselves to be people who live at a point in the in time which extends not into the past, not only into the past but also into the future. We have this we have this incredible consciousness of a future which will not be like the present mm -hmm. and i think that's quite different to uh, how people often lived in the past they may have had an understanding of different times in history uh, but they didn't have such a, a a constant awareness of a future and i think that's the thing that weighs on us very heavily in the present and the I, second I, thing I, is we, we we have these so we, we have the, we do have these extraordinary tools at our disposal um uh you know we we have um uh, Stuart Brand's kind of famous phrase, we, we, we are as gods, uh, we better start getting used to it, uh, but getting good at it rather. Uh, that's a comment about the nature of the technology we have in the present, uh, which allows us to have this kind of incredible view of, of the planet that's never been available to us before. Mm -hmm. And that on the one hand is stoking all of these kind of fears and uncertainties, but also is a tool that we can use and put to use uh, if it's done so thoughtfully and with care. Um, and with a, a far greater degree of respect for the other beings that we share the planet with than we've exhibited so far. That's, that's the important part. I think that we, if we can accept the idea of the first thing that we talked about, the idea that intelligence is a collective enterprise, then we start to engender that respect. As long as we think that we're the smart part, then we're in trouble, I think. Now, I see Rosie has just reappeared there. I've reappeared just because there are lots of questions. I mean, I have to say, I could sit here and listen to you two for the rest of the night. It's completely fascinating. Um, I have a, a, an immediate question that springs up out of all of this, which is how do you bring this idea of world intelligence, all these other intelligence into the politics of climate change? Because everything about our politics at the moment is control. Uh, it's not about art. You can see art gets dismissed in repressive societies. It's not about randomness. It's about trying to hold on to things. And, you know, you think of just the biodiversity loss, which is, uh, is what keeps me awake a lot at night. Um, how do you use what you've learned, James and Brian, how do you use art to shock people, change people's thinking? Uh, shall I start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think what, what an artist can do is offer other worlds for consideration. You can say, what do you think it would be like if things were like this? How does that feel to you? And this very clearly happens in novels and films and so on because they're narrative. So you can easily see what worlds are being offered. And you, can, you start to think about your own world through experiencing another one by engage, immersing yourself in another one. But I think every single work of art, from a Cezanne painting to an earring, they all do the same thing. They all suggest a world and a world view. Um, I could go into detail about how that happens, but you take my word for it. Right. Um, um, but I think that's, that's one of the things that art does. It's, it constantly says, so I have, this, I have this little phrase, science discovers and art digests because science by definition is, um, is value free. It's supposed to be value free. We can argue about whether it is, but the idea is that I'm going to do this experiment and you can do that experiment and you should have exactly the same result. Um, the, this experiment's success has nothing to do with whether I'm tall or short or English or Japanese or anything like that. It's neutral from all of those things. And I think art is exactly the opposite. It says, when I do this, whatever the experience is, it's going to be unique to my doing of it. And when you do it, it will be unique to your doing of it. So what happens, I think, science keeps discovering beautifully, wonderful new things, but it doesn't 
actually give us any information about what to do with it, uh, what to do with it or with its products, technology. Um, it just says, look, here's, here's this, here's that, here's another thing. And I think what we do with art is we start to find out what we can do with these phenomena. Um, what, what does it make us feel? That's the first thing. How do, how do we use it? What use is it to us? What use is it to, to us emotionally, but also technically? So your turn. Sorry, I didn't mean to take so long. That <laughs> no, was great. Uh, and uh, I was just thinking as you were talking about, um, about this notion of other worlds. Um, because that is something that I return to kind of repeatedly in the book, um, which, you know, and the other worlds that I'm describing in the book are not, um, are not necessarily worlds of the imagination or, or the worlds of, of other humans, but the worlds of, of other creatures. Yes. Um, like the, the, the realization that um, there are many, many worlds uh, and they're all coexisting in the present in ways that are sometimes accessible to us and sometimes are not in any way accessible to us. But there's moments of real, realization. I think what, what Brian is talking about is that in, in the moment of, of the creation of worlds in this artistic way, what you're suggesting is that other ways, other worlds are possible, yes. that other ways of being in the world mm -hmm. are possible, other ways of relating to the world are possible. Yes. And so when you talk about this in, in relationship to other species, um, to other understandings of the world, whether that's, you know, in, in the book I talk about, for example, a bunch of recent experiments showing the kind of extraordinary abilities of plants that plants uh, plants certain species of plants are capable of hearing uh, that they appear to exhibit memory that they rec that they record and recall experiences and behave differently in the future abilities that we had no idea that they possessed possessed previously but crucially suggest that plants have a world right they have an awareness of the world uh, that's unique to them as well and those worlds are all around us and the realization for me is that multiple worlds already exist, are kind of growing all around us all the time, is exactly this call to the realization that multiple worlds are possible, that many worlds are possible, that other worlds and other ways of being in the world are possible. And that for me is a, is a deeply radical shift in perception. Um, yeah, I, I, and any shift in perception at, the, at that degree is also inherently a political <laughs> event. Um, yep, because yep. it shifts our, our relationships to one another and the possible relationships that we may have with one another. Yep. And so that for me, there's always something deeply political about that as well. Yep. Yep. So Peter Turner asked an interesting question here. Native American people believe that all things have consciousness and are reachable through their ceremonies. Ceremonies are intended to alter the being of the participants. Might this, be, might this way of thinking be applied to your topics, both, both Brian and James? James, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I have to be quite careful in, in both in writing the book and talking about this, but many of the things I'm talking about are pretty obvious to non-European peoples uh, and in fact are a large part of their cosmology and a large part of their histories and a large part of their very daily awarenesses. And it's really only um, uh, a particular we in the West um, uh, and, and from a certain kind of historical scientific tradition that are not aware of this and that do not have this as, as part of our being and awareness. Uh, what I find really interesting is when these, these, these worlds overlap in certain ways, uh, when it's possible to approach the same truths and stories um, from, from both uh, kind of Western scientific perspectives and uh, non-Western or indigenous perspectives. A really good example of someone who does this, who I write about in the book, is a scientist called Monica Galliana. Uh, she's someone who did a bunch of the experiments that I just mentioned around um, plant memory, for example. And what's really fascinating about Galliano's work is not only is she a, a rigorous scientist, uh, a plant behaviorist, a botanist, and she's done the kind of uh, value neutral science that Brian just mentioned, that are reproducible, that are peer reviewed, that correspond to all of this, um, uh, the, the kind of the norms that make up the kind of edifice of scientific knowledge. Uh, she's also um, someone who has an advanced shamanic practice. And she goes to um, to South America and Mesoamerica, and has uh, worked with certain plant, uh, pl certain plants and certain plant spirits. And those plant spirits have helped her to design her experiments. Mm -hmm. And they've actually told her, uh, you know, certain things that she can do in order to create the kind of scientific outcomes that she's interested in doing. This really pisses off a lot of scientists who really hate this stuff. 
right? Um, uh, but the thing is, because she also does the science, the, sci the, the science works, right? It's, it's, it's peer reviewed, it's reproducible, it's all of those things. So you don't have to care about her shamanic practice. You don't have to even believe what she's saying because the science still works, yes. right? So you can, you can do from both things. What I find kind of particularly fascinating, like just on myself, is even for me, that's a really hard thing to grasp. Yes. Someone who is both like, has a scientific training and conditioning and appreciates the science. Someone who is also, spoken with plant spirits on certain occasions, even I struggle to put those two things together because they belong to such different realms of experience and understanding. Right? Yes. So even, even within ourselves, within individuals, we have these, this really split tendency to, um, to address the world through these different structures of understanding and thinking that we, yeah. even with ourselves, struggle to put together. Yes, yes. It's a little bit like... I met a very good scientist who turned out to be an evangelical Christian and didn't seem to have any trouble reconciling these two entirely different and often contradictory worlds in his mind. So, yes, it is, it is a struggle to deal well, with. It points, it points to the fact that they're not contradictory, I think, for yeah. me. But, but what they are hard is to, is to put into fixed systems of knowledge, right? They're hard to, they're hard to think about and talk about. Uh, in terms of like fixed, clear statements that don't allow for the kind of complexity and uncertainty that we've been talking about all along. Yeah. So a question here from Duncan, um, which is intriguing. So are financial industrial crashes analogous to the mental breakdown of a hive or a collective mind system? And if that's true, why doesn't the collective memory work about why you keep repeating things? That's a good question. <laughs> they do. I have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> well, Brian, do you want to start? <laughs> yes, I, I think one thing that's different about human affairs is that we've learned to override the feedback systems and the consequences of feedback systems. For instance, the crash of 2008 should have been the end of the banking system as we knew it. It, it was a mm. complete catastrophe and it was the result of, a, of an ideology that didn't work. But instead of saying, oh, that ideology didn't work, we better do something different. We just bailed the banks out with public money and uh, carried on as though nothing had happened. So in, in natural systems, there tends to be a kind of punishment for making for major evolutionary or ecological mistakes. Somehow or other, things change after them. Um, but we are very good at sidestepping the consequences, at least in the short term. In the long term, of course, we won't sidestep them. Um, and that's what we're finding out now. So, so I think it, we sort of stand a little bit outside the rest of the animal world in A, our ability to sidestep consequences for quite a long time, and B, our ability to, or our tendency to concentrate resources. Um, again, most animal systems don't have ways of infinitely storing wealth. Um, you know, squirrels can keep nuts over the winter. Uh, animals can put on a lot of fat so that they can go through cold periods. But there's no equivalent to Jeff Bezos in the animal world, as far as I know. We have devised systems of concentrating, not only creating huge amounts of wealth, but concentrating it in a few people. And it's called capitalism, actually, that system. Very interesting. James, what, what's your response to that question? Um, I mean, the, the, the thing that actually makes me think of in, in this relationship between perhaps financial system and like another complex system like the hive is that I, I come to believe that all of these systems, however complex, not necessarily capitalism, but the structure like the stock market, is, um, is an emergent uh property or structure of the world itself and that therefore there are going to be these relationships between things that, that model them in certain ways in fact quite recently i heard a, a talk by someone who who used quite advanced economic models to explain the relationships of various plant species as they negotiate and trade uh, in this person's description in the mycelial networks that kind of underlie forest floors these networks of, of fungal threads that connect various plants and allow them to communicate and 
exchange nutrients. And that seems to be modelable through, um, uh, through these kind of economic metaphors. And I think the thing to remember is always that any model that we apply, in, in this case, an economic one to those systems, is perhaps useful within a particular period, but is far less complex, in fact, than any reality that's going on. Um, but what's what I, I keep noticing happening and, and that recurs several times as I was writing the book and coming to understand these things is the way in which a lot of these systems that we build and that we think are kind of unique to us actually turn out to be minor or poor models of things that are existing in the world anyway, um, but that we hadn't really noticed because we're so blind to them. And the, the mycelial networks I just mentioned are a really good example of that. Um, we just really had no idea that these things were there. Um, but which I'm sure most of the people listening have now heard about because there's a, really a, a lot of information starting to emerge about them. Um, but one of the reasons we realized that they were there is that we built the internet. Um, and that was a very specific process that happened. We built a worldwide network of computers that communicated with one another. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we built a network that was so complex that we needed a special new kind of mathematics to understand that. And only when we develop that special new kind of mathematics were we capable of modeling and therefore seeing and being aware of these natural networks that existed in the world. And that is not to say that the mycelial networks are like the internet. Uh, they're not the same thing, but they clearly have some kind of model relationship between them that allows us to understand them in certain ways. And so we can understand hives and, and various kind of social relationships through animals through these kind of economic models. Um, because of course there's a relationship to them because we live in the same world um, but they also have kind of huge limits um, but which are also as Brian has pointed out kind of useful for pinpointing exactly where we're going horribly wrong and possibly trying to adjust that as well. I think we're going to have to leave it on that note as we've run quite badly over time. Um, thank you both so very much. Um, James's book uh, Ways of Being is brilliant. It's out now. Please get it from New and Books or from any nice independent bookstore. Brian has got albums coming out and they're always good as well as lots of books. Um, I really like that line, works that do work. Um, thank yeah. you very much. Your book, James, absolutely does that and uh, it's been a total treat to spend an hour with you and Brian, as ever, it's a complete treat to see you. Um, take care everybody and good night. Thanks so much. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.